I, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk, especially every, how many here are private industry? You guys all purposely sat over here? <laughs> hmm? The regulators over here? Regulators, show hands? Awesome. So I'm very excited to have a chance because um, this is an issue that comes up for me quite a bit. Um, and I see some differences across the state. I see a lot of differences in how surface contamination in indoor uh, in buildings is handled. And there's, I mean, you know, take home lesson, end of the story, there's not clear guidance. So what we're going to talk today is about some of the approaches that are used and some of the um, better uh, approaches, some of the worst things, things of that nature. So hopefully everybody's here in the right place. Um, I, I, I really appreciate having this opportunity to raise these issues, although I, I don't know about getting that after lunch time slot. How many people just had a great big lunch, right? And they put us pretty much, I think, geographically as far away from where we all got our lunch from. So um, what I want to ask is uh, your help in terms of making this afternoon go smoothly and I think be more enjoyable for all of us is that I'm going to request some participation from everybody. Is everybody, well, I promise you don't have to like sing or dance or do anything embarrassing, but I do want this to be interactive. I want to get feedback from regulators and non-regulators. We're going to talk about a lot of examples, a lot of case studies, and I even have some written case studies that I might pass out and we might try and do a little bit, bit of group activities. So is everybody uh, willing to to go with me there? Here's why it's important, because uh, we got a couple of hours, and I think by making it more interactive, you guys will get more out of it, and I'll have fewer people sleeping in the back of the classroom at the end there. So um, the other thing I'd like is, if I could, can I get everybody to move forward a little bit? I know that there's that inevitable tendency of everybody to, to gravitate to the back of the class, especially the, uh, the troublemakers. But if we could just move forward, I would appreciate it. What kind of kids sat in the back of class in high school, right? That's, you know? I don't know every, I know you, and he looks like a troublemaker. So, why, thank you. So we'll kind of increase the density. I'm going to pass out some things. I'm going to ask you guys to sort of talk amongst yourselves with a couple of little case studies that I have as we go through some different scenarios, and it'll just be helpful if we're all sitting a little bit closer together. All right, everybody with me so far? We're here until, what is our official ending time? 4.45, right? Sounds good. Know what it says? Yeah. I don't know that we're going to go that whole length, all right? But what we will do is we're going to take breaks about once an hour or so, um, stretch our legs, do whatever we need to do. So kind of a package deal. I'll try and make sure we stop about once an hour or so, take a 10 minute break or so, and I'll ask you guys to all get back within that time uh, uh, frame, all right? So let me ask the thing, can, can somebody share maybe some uh, examples of where they've had to manage indoor contamination? Anybody have some scenarios, some issues, something that maybe has caused a problem in the past? What are some projects you've worked on that has involved wipe sampling and indoor contamination? Meth labs. How many people here have, um, what's the official name of it, the night clandestine methamphetamine cleanup act of 2005, something along those lines? How many people have had some experience with that? Really? I love working with this crowd. This is a very different than the, the normal audience. And so what's the issue there? What, what, what have the challenges been? That's a really good point. Everybody here had the, the, the circumstance with these meth houses where what was required to comply with the standard cost a whole bunch of money. 
did a lot of damage to the house, right? cooking with solvents and they're doing a solvent extraction within a mantle so that permeates drywall everything else and then they're decanting the waste out and they're pouring that typically down the toilet or the bathtub and so essentially they were doing this in a trailer and they ended up by the time they ripped everything out that looked stained and discolored and smelled bad they just crushed the whole trailer into the landfill too that wasn't so much the big problem as the septic tank, the system that they had, that this was all deposited into. So, and, and that we tried to be very economical with that. There was already a lot of bio going on. I worked with them and said, find the right plug, beat up what you've got in the tank. They did, because nothing else was flowing into it. They treated the septic tank as a bioreactor and uh, got it done. So sometimes it's easier to just to scrap the place. And I know we've certainly done ones where we had to do a lot of damage to the house to meet the standard. I think I saw some other hands go up that had similar circumstances. And, and, and why is it we have to do so much damage? Why do we have to rip off sheetrock and everything like that? What's the driver? Compliance with something, right? With the specific standard for indoor contamination, yes? We have, we'll talk about this more. Has anybody had cleanups, interior renovations, decontamination, where there was not a specific regulatory limit for the wipe sample results? Has that ever come up? What have you guys done? What approaches have you taken? OK. That's correct. So we don't have a value, do we? For the meth labs? Yes. Well, be, I mean, I don't know. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So hold that and we'll come back to it. But there are certain specific standards in that law. It's like the only law that mentions industrial hygienists almost. Why can't you guys encapsulate We should just change this to the, like the meth lab house. Um, just curious. I, I've never done any of that. I'm just wondering why you would encapsulate it like the uh, 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 hold, we'll, we'll come back to it. The short answer is it just doesn't seem to work all that well. Um, you use a, I guess I'm not coming back to it, am I? You, you, you use a methanol extraction. You have to use a methanol soaked uh, wipe. And it really, for whatever reason, and trust me, I've tried it every which way, and I don't 100% understand it, but it's like it sucks that methamphetamine right through the pain. I've tried it with high salt. I've tried it with everything. Um, so we've got some like PCBs where we don't have standards. We've got methamphetamine. We have, do you have anybody here had to deal with metals? Lead, arsenic, cadmium? Yeah, Give us cadmium, I worked at a plant that had a cadmium abrasive blast. Okay. And over the years, you know, it was a little more careful than others. And then the plant shutting down. So somebody said, all right, I see what cadmium is on the wall. So I did wipe sampling and I got numbers. Okay. But I didn't really know what to do with the data. I just kind of passed on the data. Right. Um, there was nobody really working in the plant anymore, so I wasn't worried about that. I thought, well, when they demo the place, you know, cadmium contaminated surfaces, and you know, what will they do? Is it enough to worry about? Somebody would have to decide. I couldn't decide right there. Is it enough to worry about, yeah. right? That's really the question, isn't it? It was present. I could find cadmium, but that's right. I, it's like, you know, I, I do my, whenever I do my HAZCOM classes, or probably for all of you guys, you talk about hazard and risk, and how much arsenic do you want in your drinking water, right? You know, how much do you want? I don't want any, right? But let's say, do we get zero? We don't get zero. So, so, right, so somebody's got to decide how much is okay. I got some cadmium there. All right, now what, right? Excellent. Let me ask you guys this. How many people, uh, I've got regulators, somebody's going to raise their hand here. 
have had the job of coming in after a business leaves and deciding whether they've cleaned up all of their hazardous materials, how, how their hazardous wastes adequately. Nobody? Mike, one guy, that's it? Come on, put your hands up. So let me ask you guys this. We were talking about this last night. What are your criteria? What are you looking for? What do you care about when you do that? Who are you protecting? Future use of the building, so the, the occupants of that building in there, all right? How do you evaluate that? Okay. Sounds they interesting. Use DE wine mm -hmm. Yeah, for a filter media. Get some free right off the beat. <laughs> okay, so you're concerned about the inhalation exposure of future occupants to that diatomaceous earth. Okay. Not so much the dermal. They mitigated it very Yeah, that's an easy one, yeah. right? Um, anybody have any other examples where they had to come in and perform some sort of evaluation? Yes, sir. I love it. So what are those nationally recognized standards? Because we could all go home as soon as you tell us. <laughs> well, if you guys bear with me, by the end of the day, you're going to be familiar with some of those. But I'll tell you right now, none of them are perfect. They all have problems. And so as those of us that are on either side of this equation of trying to clean these places up, trying to decide if they're clean enough, we need to be knowledgeable consumers, right? We need to be aware of the approach we're taking, and there's trade-offs, right? Just like with drinking water and arsenic. Sure, we don't want any, but sometimes we have to make some cost-benefit decisions. We talk about these methamphetamine houses, right? And the law um, has set certain requirements, but they're very burdensome, and if we're going to uh, 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 apply these very burdensome requirements to a structure, we want to feel like there's a, uh, a, a risk to the occupant that is equal to the, to the burden. Does that make sense to everybody? In some cases, we don't get that. So, so just to set the stage, those are the kind of issues that I think about when we deal with these things. So let me, let me throw you guys a little bit of a hypothetical case study. So you see my shooting range here? Indoor shooting range. Uh, picture's a little bit blurry, but y'all get the picture. Everybody seen the shooting range before? Have some familiar, familiarity with it? Stand here, shoot the bullets that way, right? So here's what happens in my hypothetical scenario. 20,000 square feet, indoor shooting range, 15 years. Guess what? Oh. <laughs> so everybody's chuckling. So apparently, some of you think there might be a problem here. Okay, so what are we concerned about? Lead. lead, right? We're concerned about lead because we have potentially sensitive receptors there. We know that that operation, operation of a shooting range, is likely to contaminate that property, right? We're all on the same page there? Whoops. Don't want to jump the gun. So we're concerned about lead. What do we need to do? What, what would your approach be if that kind of came across your guys' desks? 15 years. It's contaminated as heck. You would, there's visible accumulation of lead dust everywhere. Top, bottom, roof. So the first thing we need to say, are you guys sure you want to make it a preschool? But let's just bear with me for this hypothetical example. What would a theoretical approach be? Well, 
Mm -hmm. Don't bother to sample, clean it. I'm with you there, right? We don't need to go and do a whole bunch of elaborate sampling. This may be one of those ones where, you know, I'm getting a cleanup contractor. Now, there may absolutely need to be some interim sampling. I know I've got to clean, but how clean do I need to get it there? Anybody have any ideas on that? Any thoughts on the subject? How clean does that need to be? But we know that it's going to be similar in use to the HUD lead standards, correct? And there are some, and we'll talk about those. So in this case, we can identify a pretty clear cut contaminant, lead, and we have some reasonably good regulatory guidelines. Everybody with me so far? Does that make sense? So let me give you a little bit different scenario. What does that look like to you guys? Looks like a lab, right? How many of you guys have had some experience in laboratories? We get lots of biotechs here in San Diego, the Bay Area, places like that, right? Looks like a lab. I've made up my nice clever name there. Let's say it's about 5,000 square feet. Lab-based research and development, 15 employees, and they do lab stuff, all right? They're not working with crazy nanomaterials. They're not working with highly potent compounds, active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, anything like that. It's just generic kind of lab stuff, all right? Biosafety level one, a um, little bit of lab scale. By lab scale, of course, I mean sort of on the scale of less than four liters. Right? Small containers, small quantities, a couple of flammable storage cabinets, a fume hood, maybe some storage underneath. You guys all get in the picture? You guys all see what I'm talking about here? All right? Got a couple of chemical fume hoods, nothing crazy going on there. They're out of here. They're off to New Jersey. All right? So you guys come in afterwards and you figure out what do we need to do once they, once they vacate. Do we need to do anything? They pack up their moving boxes, they're out, we good to go? So what would you look for, just in general? Like anything in particular? Like I said, we know I'll, I'll just kind of stipulate, we don't have any high hazard stuff, we don't have any metals. Okay, so perchlorates, I don't want to blow up my fume, but although, do people use perchlorates anymore? But it's worth checking, fair enough. You're an old school guy, I know. You've been around for a while. What do you worry about? Leaving residual on the floor and such that um, could hurt the next people who use the plant or do the construction of the thing. If they're like laying on the floor and wriggling. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm being, I'm just. Uh, you know. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, there, uh, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about acids too, but I get where you're going. There could be some sort of residual. So, uh, we're in California, right? So corrosive solids exists. It's going to be used for another biotech. Okay. I'm making it up, but what the heck. Because of corrosivity, because of uh, uh, corrosion in the ductwork. Yeah. Well, that's because they're cheap and they're not buying the stainless steel ductwork at the beginning, but I'm, right. I'm, I'm not going to tell them that. So we're worried about the corrosives. I heard a couple of corrosives. Maybe you would worry about the plumbing, checking the infrastructure. Yeah, fair enough. Is that a safety issue, or is that really more of a building? It would probably be something we would be asked to look at. Uh -huh. And um, maybe mercury in the drain trap. You had a comment in the back? Could happen. Could happen. So, so um, is this situation a little bit more complicated than the shooting range one? You think? Do I care? I, I, I'm not being facetious. Do we care? One lab moves out, a new lab moves in. I'm not turning it into a daycare center, right? So, do we care? Does anybody feel like it would need? How many people feel like we would need to do some sort of formal clearance process for this? Show of hands. Good 50%. How many people feel like if they move out, they pack up their stuff, it looks physically clean, there's not crud everywhere, 
they've, you know, they've moved out. How many feel like that's good enough? A few brave souls. Come on, put your hands up. I know you're out there. I will tell you, I don't know how many of these we've done. I don't know that I've ever, I shouldn't say that. For this kind of simple scenario with just a move and a relocation, I don't know that I've ever had an insurance company as part of it. I will tell you that when we have to do more than general physical cleaning, it's because the COOPA or the fire marshal or some other environmental regulatory entity has requested that of the um, occupants. Right? So I'm not saying there aren't any issues. It's just that that just has not been the way it's played out. But this is conceptually a little bit trickier, right? What did we have? What was our chemical of concern for the shooting range? We all knew that. As soon as I put that up there, we all laughed. We knew this was silly. It was kind of funny because we all know that lead's, right? We look at this one. We're 50-50 over whether we need to do anything at all, right? So you can see this is sort of the issue, right? And I get to go to all different parts of the state and different parts of the country. And I know what I need to do here in San Diego, and I know what I need to do in Santa. Anybody here from Santa Clara County? Can I pick on Santa Clara? Oh, sorry. Um, I know what I need to do in other parts of the state. I know that there's some history in the Bay Area that drives facility closures, right? There's a lot of reasons, but I see all these differences, all these disparities. And like I said, I just want to lay out some issues today, and we can, we can have a little fun talking about them. All right, how about this one here? Any San Diego folks? So this isn't really Chatham Brothers, I'll tell you that right now. That's actually, um, what was it called in Kentucky? There you go, that's the one. That's the photo. But Chatham Brothers was a site here in San Diego. I just couldn't find any good photos, so um, I wanted a photo. 13 acres, oil recycling, soil vapor, groundwater contamination. What are we concerned with here? You name it. So what do we do? What do we do for a site like that? Well, so, so tell, say what you just said again. You're going to have to remove what's obviously there, but after that, you have to do the full assessment. And is there a procedure for that? You betcha, right? <laughs> There's a where I'm going with this is, have these kind of things happened before? Yeah. Do we have a mechanism to deal with these? Do we have regulations that tell us what we need to do? We have guidance, correct? We may argue about the details of it, but something like this pops up. I've been sitting through a couple of sessions that uh, the Robert Weiss from the EPA has been leading about HAZWAP or emergency response, and we got mechanisms and machinery that kicks into gear, right? And it tells us we're going to follow these procedures to do the cleanup, and then is there a procedure for the site assessment? Absolutely, right? We have procedures. What's the difference between, oops, I can't work the machine here. What's the difference between this lab area and that? What's the difference? What's the big difference there? That's right. That's a better way of saying it than I was going to, right? This super fun site, pick your example. I was leafing through uh, National Geographic this morning, and I saw, like, they had a little article, one of the recent ones, right? Pick your favorite super fun site. This is clearly environmental contamination, right? I got a room full of environmental regulators, right? You guys know how to apply environmental regulations, right? You're here, you're at a conference, you're educating yourselves. We know about this. This one, is that environment? Well, kind of. They probably generated hazardous waste. They probably, I told you, they used hazardous chemicals. So, I mean, it's kind of. But what rules, what regulations apply? Who here raised their hand when I said that we needed to do some sort of cleanup activity when they moved out? Why, what regulate, what regulatory, under what regulatory authority would you require that? Uh, because they've had both business plans for what they store on site. They also are probably a waste generator, although 
a safe bet. Mm -hmm. They do need to close out their business plan, and we got to go there. And that's generally the approach that we have, although different Coupas are more or less formal about how they would like to structure that closure. Sir? I don't quite understand. I mean, once they've removed the hazardous materials, the subject is closed. Well, the Lab benches are there. I will tell you, based on my personal opinion, I almost, based on my personal opinion, I would be fine with that. But I will also tell you that, that in my professional experience, there's been people that haven't been fine with that. I bet there's some people in this room that, that think we need to do more than that. So I don't know that we're going to answer the question, right? But you can see that we're in a little bit more of a gray area with respect to regulatory compliance. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, a few nods of the head out there? All right. So um, just to kind of wrap up this first part of what we're talking about then, um, who are we protecting, right? When we're talking about interior decon, general public, is that who we're protecting? Maybe. Depends on the building. It might, right? Current workers or future workers? If it's a building, if it's a lab, like I was pointing out, right? Somebody's working there now, right? At least in one sense, that's sort of part of the point of all these hazardous waste and hazardous materials regulations that I have, right? Emergency response or whatever it might be. And then we've mentioned before, we don't want to leave something that would represent a hazard for future. Right? Um, property owner, are they a stakeholder in this issue? Right? And here's the thing, in any different setting, circumstance, project, there's going to be sort of a, a different mix of these things, isn't there? Right? Which makes it a little bit harder to figure out like some blanket answer. So again, I hope nobody was walking into this today thinking when you walk out of here, boom, you're going to have some sort of black and white answer that, that I know everything and we're good. Because really, hopefully you leave here with a better understanding of the issues. Yes, sir? I, I guess so. Not every Coupa requires a closure plan, but let's say they, that you have a Coupa plan and you say you're Santa Clara County. Is that correct? I'm within Santa Clara. Okay, so, but so you guys, in general, I, I, I don't know I've done business with all the PAs, but, but certainly there is a much more robust closure process than many other parts of the state. So we submit a closure plan. Somebody's going to look at it. Somebody's going to review it. And if I'm a consultant and I say we're going to go through and we're going to do what Todd said, we're just going to clean everything really good, it's going to be spick and span, and that's it. Somebody's going to review it and have to make the call. That correct. Right? That's good enough or it's not good enough. That, that, that or not. So, for example, if they're saying that another exact same business is moving in, and they're going to have to make the call. Yeah. So it's going to the daycare. Well, and, and, and that's, that's exactly where I'm going with this, that, that this is not a blanket where we can come up with some universal solution. It's going to depend on the circumstances. So we haven't talked about how to do the sampling or those nationally recognized standards that I wished we had. We're still just on whether we should even 
whether it's even needed, right? But clearly, these different stakeholders are going to affect our um, decision-making process. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Does that make sense? Right? So it's not a simple process. I wish it was. It's not a simple process. Lots of moving parts, lots of players. All right. So here's my question. I'm going to get back to some of the issue that, that David mentioned before, and I'm going to try and operate my slides a little better. Um, all right. Let's say for the sake of exam, that for the sake of argument, we feel like we need to do some sort of assessment process. All right? What are we worried about? What are we protecting people from? Think in your mind maybe about that example of a laboratory that I gave you just a couple of minutes ago. All right? So don't say that too loud. Hold that thought. Let me go, let me go through the steps. What are we worried about, right? And, and I'll, I'll prime the pump a little bit. I'll try to. Flammability. Are we worried about flammability? What would it take in terms, again, let me back up and make sure we're all on the same page. I'm talking about surface contamination. You walk into a structure, it's generally physically clean. I don't mean there's tons of abandoned chemical containers or gross green or yellow or whatever. I mean, it's basically physically clean and you want to do some sort of cleanup assessment. So um, when we're thinking that that might be necessary, what are we worried about? What type of hazards, what classes of hazards are we worried about here? And like I said, I'm throwing you a bone here. Are we worried about flammability? What would it take for there to be sufficient surface contamination that it represented a flammability hazard? It would take maybe gross contamination of dust above the NFPA, whatever thickness of a paper clip over whatever percentage of the circumstance. OK, but, but those are explosive, not flammable issues. And it's physically clean, right? It's not like the DE example. It's physically clean. So is there a reasonable circumstance where we're really worried about flammability? I don't think so. Because in order to have enough surface contamination of a flammable liquid, it's going to be gross contamination, correct? And we would all agree that that kind of heavy gross contamination needs to be cleaned up, right? We don't need a standard for that. If there's pools of gasoline on the floor, somebody's going to be cleaning that up, right? That's not the issue. So we're not really so worried about flammables, are we? So I'm going to ask somebody in a minute about whether they've ever made somebody do wipe tests for VOCs, but you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. <laughs> Explosives. Reactives. Again, physically clean. I, I, I understand there can be combustible dust hazards, and depending on what people are doing, maybe I um, guess you can make an argument in a chemical fume hood where they used uh, perchloric acid and there were perchlorates. I mean, there are certain specific circumstances. But in general, the lab scenario that I gave, are we worried about reactivity? I don't think so. I'm not worried about an exploding lab bench. Just not, all right? Whoops. I guess something funky is on my slides. But in any case, what about this one here? What's that represent? Corrosivity. Are we worried about corrosivity? Right. You had said you were thinking about that. And it can, we can have corrosive residues. So, you know, I, I, I joke, we're in California. In the rest of the country, there's no such thing as a corrosive solid, right? But we're in California. So um, I, I suppose. I mean, my, I will tell you that my prejudice, preconception, is that if it's physically clean, it's hard for me to see how there could be sufficient corrosive solid residue to represent a significant hazard. Okay? On the other hand, we certainly all know that there are residues that could be corrosive if they got wet. And so I, 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 uh, I used my prerogative as a presenter and I hedged my bets. Now the good thing about this is I'm, I'm going to skip way ahead and talk about assessment. What do we have to do to assess surface contamination with corrosives? I got pH paper right here. You know what I mean? Is that an easy test to conduct? 
So all right, maybe you're going to worry about it, but at least we're not doing wipe tests and labs and turnaround time and all that kind of stuff. You got Interesting. Out of the concrete. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Smart move, right? Just get, get rid of it. Interesting. And I'll, I'll give you a similar example. We were doing a plating shop cleanup up in LA where most of the gross contamination was removed from the secondary containment pits, but one pit that had formerly been used for their cyanide solutions had been repurposed. It was not used to hold uh, uh, cyanide solutions anymore. But in the demolition process, the building burned. It collapsed. It was this huge, big mess. And so liquids were everywhere. And as we started disturbing liquids, and some of them ran into this particular secondary containment pit, um, we had measurable levels of cyanides from the residue. And this was not like heavy, visible contamination. But it was certainly measurable. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, and we, we were, I mean, yeah, exactly. And that's a little bit different than kind of the areas that I'm thinking about here. But all I want to say is that in general, it's certainly a possibility. But for the most part, if the surface is physically clean, it's unlikely to me that it's going to represent a significant corrosivity hazard. Yes? Anybody feel strongly opposed to that? You're just tired of me talking about it? <laughs> so I just, I just don't see corrosivity as the big deal. But what are we concerned about? Right? It's really an issue of toxicity. And it helps me, when I think about these projects, to keep that in mind, that it's toxicity that I care about. Right? And it helps me sort of mentally clear the decks and put some of these other issues aside. I'm worried about people getting sick from whatever it might be. And that helps me think about it, because while uh, toxicity is a complex characteristic. We at least have some uh, thought processes that we can follow when we evaluate potential toxicity, right? We deal with toxic things and uh, potential exposures to toxic materials uh, all the time, correct? The things that, in my mind, drive an elevated level of concern for surface contamination are things that have a relatively high toxicity and aren't going to go anywhere, right? So if I have metals contamination, right? If it's there, that's a problem. Pesticides, persistent uh, organics. What else might we add to this? Does anybody, you had mentioned one in the back, PCBs. I mean, I guess that falls into the persistent category. Anybody else have any other ones to add? Asbestos? Yeah. Okay, you know, so there's a few that are out there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, D, the, the, the thing there is that I kind of feel like if it's physically clean, it probably doesn't have a super high hazard because I'm, but you know, fair enough. It's another. So, issues of talk. Toxicity is really what we're thinking about when we have to do surface decontamination. Like I said, to me, it helps think of it in this terms because I can put those other issues aside when I'm thinking about how am I going to approach that. All right. So again, sort of like toxicity 101, right? The whole dose makes the poison deal. How many of us have heard this quote about 10 million times in our life? Maybe 20 million times? But it's important to think about, right? This is a fundamental concept that helps us orient ourselves when we evaluate that. So when we're thinking about toxicity, when we're thinking about potential exposures to toxic materials, we got to go all the way back to sort of HASCOM 101, right? What are our routes of exposure? Am I worried about dermal contact? Am I worried about ingestion? Am I worried about inhalation, right? And what kind of dose am I talking about? 
right? I mean, there are, uh, obviously, we recognize there are some things that have high potential health effects at very, very low dose, right? Botulinum toxin, or what are some other scary, nasty things? I work with some companies that are um, uh, manufacturing, uh, anybody familiar with antibody drug conjugates, ADCs? So this is a fascinating new area of, of anti-cancer uh, medicine where uh, companies are taking uh, anti-cancer medication that's too toxic to give to people, right? If I gave it to you as a chemotherapy agent, uh, it would kill the cancer cells, but oh, by the way, it's going to kill all the other ones too, right? Not super helpful, right? But they're taking these highly potent, highly toxic compounds and they're connecting them to an antibody, an antibody that is made to target the cancer cells. So they call them antibody drug conjugates. The drug part of the ADC, the antibody drug, are highly potent compounds. That's how they work. And it's that kind of guided missile idea where they then give them to people and that antibody sort of takes this highly potent, highly toxic compound right to these cancer cells. So it just kills the cancer cells. It doesn't kill the person, right? So pretty cool stuff. I think this kind of thing is fascinating, right? But these companies, they're working with these highly potent compounds. So there are things out there that really could be really, really bad for us, even at very, very small doses. Yes? There's other things out there that are bad for us, but maybe the dose is more moderate. Some of the metals are kind of what comes to mind or pesticides. I certainly want to manage my exposures. I don't want you guys to think I'm uh, uh, not being careful about handling hazardous materials, but, but you guys understand where I'm going with this. The degree of acute toxicity is much lower, yes? So um, is that going to affect how I think about surface sampling, how I think about contamination? What am I going to be most concerned about, APIs or metals? You think? I'm thinking about that API that like one microscopic grain and I'm dead. Right? That, I'm way more concerned about that. I'll get a little lead on my hands, you know, I'll wash it off, right? So depending on what it is, there are certain circumstances that I'm going to be more concerned. I'm going to set a much more, uh, I don't know if I want to say lower, lower threshold, right? I'm going to be, you know, above and beyond belt and suspenders kind of deal when I'm working with these potent compounds. On the other hand, lead, asbestos, I'm going to be concerned, I'm going to be safe, but maybe I'm not quite the same level, right? That's where I was headed. All right, so contaminated facilities. There's certain things that we need to break down. I want you guys to pay attention to this list because we're going to come back to this list a couple of times over the course of the afternoon. Whoops. Chemicals of concern. We've been around and around on that. What am I concerned about? What are the are there chemicals I should be concerned about? A lot of people, and I think many of us, we work in the industry, so we don't get freaked out about laboratories. But how many of you know people have come across people where you say the word laboratory and they think every single chemical on that shelf is like tetramethyl death, right? It's instantly going to kill everybody. Anybody ring any bells, right? Well, we know most of the time in laboratories, most of the stuff is relatively low to, you know, not, not that hazardous. All right? So what are our chemicals? Who are we concerned about? Right? Who are our victims? What do we need to do to characterize the contamination? That's what we were talking about before. Do we need to do anything? Is there a need to characterize the contamination? Can we just make it physically clean and move on? What do we need to do to, to remove it? We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. We were talking about the meth standard earlier. Sometimes that's not as easy as it seems. Um, what regulations apply, right? And finally, this issue of how clean is clean. And there are several different approaches. That's what we're going to talk about. But why don't we take 10 minutes right now? I take a 10 minute break. We've been going for right around an hour or so. And um, where are we at time wise? 156. So, like five minutes, five or seven minutes or whatever after uh, two.